All right, well, thank you, Max, uh, for the introduction. Thank you all also for coming after lunch and before the break. I appreciate that. Uh, I'm not sure how cool what I'm going to talk about will be because I'm effectively rolling back the clock 80 years. I'm asking you to imagine uh, that it's actually possible to construct a viable a theory of relativistic quantum mechanics that works for single particles, that is to say, without having to invoke quantum field theory. And the way that we do that is by getting rid of the wave function, uh, somewhat controversial move. Uh, but um, in fact, oh, and I should mention, uh, back up a little bit, uh, not only are we getting rid of the wave function, we're getting rid of all complex amplitudes whatsoever. So this is a completely real value theory. And uh, so it's not by any means a, a path interval kind of an approach, uh, but it is a quantum trajectory approach. Okay, but it's not Bohmian mechanics either. Uh, so the middle column there is Bohmian mechanics, and the way Bohmian mechanics works is you have both a quantum trajectory and a wave function, and what happens is the wave function influences the dynamics of the trajectory through the quantum potential, Q. Uh, but that's not what we have. What we have is on the right there, it's an ensemble of trajectories and no wave function. So uh, because we have an ensemble of trajectories even for a single particle, it's essentially many worlds kind of a theory. But it's not Everett, because our worlds interact with each other. They talk to each other. And in fact, it's exactly this inter-world communication that is the source of all quantum effects in this theory. So it's, it really is a kind of a different thing uh, than these other techniques. We do have a quantum potential, uh, but the quantum potential arises naturally from the ensemble itself. You don't need an external psi field to construct the quantum potential. All there is is the, is the ensemble of trajectories, and that's what you solve for. By the way, the, the set of trajectories that you see there is an actual solution. That's the relativistic Gaussian wave packet. OK, uh, of the three methods here, uh, they're all equivalent to the non-relativistic limit, but only the one on the right, so far as I know, admits a viable relativistic generalization. By which I mean that the usual problems of the Klein-Gordon theory, as interpreted as a single particle theory, disappear. Namely, negative energy states and negative probability density. Both of those issues disappear. So this is actually a different theory than Klein-Gordon. It makes different uh, experimental predictions that, in principle, could be measured. Uh, now, I only have time. There are some really interesting dynamical considerations here. I don't have time to talk about those. But I will discuss some interesting kinematics. So first of all, let's, let's imagine a, a single classical special relativistic particle uh, that's moving inertially, according to the red world line indicated. So that single particle, even though it moves only locally, one minute, OK. OK, even though it moves only locally, uh, it suffices to define a global coordinate system. As soon as that accelerates even a little bit, though, you lose this notion of global simultaneity. You only have local simultaneity. And in a quantum trajectory approach, you can glue together all the local patches and restore again this idea of global simultaneity. This is the key idea behind this whole approach that enables everything to happen. As a result of this, you can define a global time uh, parameter, which we call the ensemble time. It is not the same as proper time. As a result of that, you run into interesting things like the generalizer quantum twin paradox. Okay? You also have time dilation that looks very much like uh, time dilation you get in gravitation with one key difference. Because the quantum potential could be either positive or negative, you can get time compression as well as time dilation. And indeed, time compression only happens in the classically forbidden regions of space. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I would like uh, Jeff Pollockson to come up here on deck while Henrik Ulbricht tells us about Thank you. Um, okay, so that is, uh, it's about a meta wave interferometry uh, with uh, big particles. So it's like adding the interferometry, but the particles are bigger. Um, you want to test the quantum superposition principle. Um, macroscopicity, that's a new measure which has been defined um, in this paper. So that's basically a measure, a quantitative measure to compare different experiments. Um, have a look at this. What we also have to do, of course, is to uh, compare this to um, to models, there are predictions uh, from so-called collapse models. There's this review of modern physics, which uh, we brought together with Angelo Bassi He's over there. We have questions about these models, what the theory ask him, not me. Um, so what we do is stuff which is shown in this um, illustration there. So basically, you have this curve, which is one of these collapse models. And then you think about what kind of experimental sensitivity is it. 
from this graph, it's very complex and uh, you can uh, not understand it um, from looking at it, but I can tell you that you can learn from this that if it's not very promising to try an atom interferometer to test this model, it's not very promising to try uh, mechanical cantilevers, but it's very promising to try uh, molecules um, or nanoparticles. Um, our specific proposal is this here, so you start with an entrapped nanoparticle, so that is this um, illustration over there, I don't have a pointer. Um, so you, you start with the trapped particle, you try to uh, stabilize the position of the particle, so you basically work on the center of mass motion. Um, then you pass it through a grating, so that is um, like an interference experiment. What you see on the, um, on the lower corner there is a quantum carpet, so that is basically an illustration um, or a model that you did by using the Wiener function to describe this quantum state. Um, so what we have is a realistic scenario based on um, today's um, um, you know, technology, to interfere a particle which is a nanoparticle of 10 nanometer diameter that is 1 million atomic mass units, two orders of magnitude more massive than the present record held by the Vienna group. Um, there's a paper on the archive which um, you know, explains everything in detail. The next step after that, so I talk about the future, I talk about ideas, concepts which we developed to um, do this experiment. Um, that is a uh, proposal which um, we did with Mauro Paranosco uh, from Belfast. So the idea is basically to transfer this quantum superposition state start with a uh, meta wave interferometer, like an atom interferometer, and then shoot on two on a pair of um, these cantilevers on this uh, optomechanical systems, and um, transfer the superposition state to the two, and then um, use quantum optics techniques to read out this um, superposition state. And the good news is, which is described in this paper, is that um, the, the, the superposition state basically survives. And another test that is, I think, almost the final slide I have is. Um, you can also do high resolution spectroscopy. So the idea, and that's something we also worked out together with Angelo over there, um, is that you have a generic two-level system and that basically a collapse model generates something like a noise um, and that basically changes the transmission lines of your emission of this two-level system. So you see a shift and a broadening and we worked this out for different um, systems and um, uh, it looks promising. It is not a completely strange effect and it's not a completely small effect. Um, so, for instance, NMR spectroscopy is only a few orders of magnitude away in sensitivity to see um, this effect that we have learned. And that's the very last um, transparency. There's uh, basically the formation of, an, of a group to do an experiment in space. It's called MACRO um, because the limitation to do this microscopic quantum superposition experiments um, is small g, is the um, acceleration um, of Earth's gravity to overcome this. Um, there's the plan to do this experiment in space. Thanks. Yeah, we're good. So I'm um, just going to quickly describe some work uh, that I've been doing with um, Yakir Aharonov and his group. So the usual uh, way of thinking about the uncertainty in quantum mechanics, uh, according to Einstein, he says, God does not play dice. We ask why. Um, the traditional answer is that nature is capricious. Um, so there's an alternative way of thinking about that, which is that uh, the quantum mechanics allows you to independently select two boundary conditions, one initially and one finally. Um, and so this is a, a new kind of reformulation of quantum mechanics described in terms of two wave functions instead of one. Um, so this is a reformulation of quantum mechanics. Uh, why would you do such a thing? Well, the first thing you want to make sure is that it's consistent with the standard quantum mechanics. And there's a proof using that. Okay, that's good. Next thing you want to do is that you want a reformulation to bring out new features. And the third thing you want to do is it stimulates other fields in physics, simplifies calculations, and the holy grail, of course, is it gives you some you know, new theory, like a generalization of quantum mechanics. So uh, the new thing is there's what's called the ABL formula. <clears throat> in particular, I'm going to focus on this thing called the weak value of an observable. Um, uh, one thing I suggested in my PhD thesis was this thing that's become known as the uh, uh, quantum Cheshire cat. So you know the story in Alice in Wonderland, in one box, you got your cat, and the other box, with no smile. In the other box, you got a smile, no cat. And the idea is like separating a particle from its properties. Um, so we actually did this. Um, the box is corresponding to arms of an interferometer. Um, and actually, we did this with neutrons. Uh, if you did the calculations, you can see that uh, <coughs> the weak values of where the, of where the particle, where the neutron is, <coughs> is in one arm. The weak value of where the spin end is zero. There's no neutron in this arm, but the spin is there. Anyway, I don't have time to describe the neutron experiment, but it was successful. Um, <clears throat> this is sort of the, the picture of 
how this kind of uh, uh, weak values is consistent with um, causality. This is, blue thing is your measuring device. Here's the weak value. You can see it's way outside the, the eigenvalue spectrum, but you also see that it's much more likely that you get these impossible results as just an error or noise of your measuring device. So um, this led us to a new axiomatic approach to quantum mechanics. Namely, we can derive the uncertainty from deeper axioms like non-locality and time, and causality, so on and so forth. And also working on, uh, yes, a uh, approach, uh, what we call weak information. Mm -hmm. I have this article if you want it to kind of review. Um, <clears throat> well, we don't have too much time for the uh, main part of the talk, which is to show you some very surprising things about the correspondence principle. The correspondence principle seems to be pretty benign. There's no big issue. Quantum mechanics meshes very nicely with, uh, with uh, uh, classical physics. Um, but we have an example in which that is not true. <clears throat> Here's a little bit of complicated interferometer. If you do quantum and classical calculations, you get the same result. Um, but the question is, what is the story that they tell? Classically, it's the photons that end up in this detector, which push this movable mirror in. The quantum mechanical calculations show you that it's actually uh, the photons that end up in that detector. So <clears throat> this has actually major implications. Let's skip over this, Let's skip over this. Um, my last point is that uh, a generalization of quantum mechanics, and that is <clears throat> if you want to think about time in a new way, namely due to Heraclides, each moment of time is a new universe, and everybody bathed twice in the same river, then you can do this. And my final slide, that's how you do it, you can see that. Um, a new book out, new journal, please submit uh, papers to our new journal. And we have a new institute, there's a new po postdoc position available, if anybody has a postdoc, needs a job and uh, <clears throat> got some really incredible members in the Institute already. Great. I get it. Thank you. <laughs> so I'm gratified to hear people talking about decoherent histories here at the conference, uh, uh, and thankful to Sean for introducing the idea. Uh, I want to make a connection with, uh, between information and the uncertainty principle. Um, the main idea of decoherent histories, quantum mechanics, is to elevate quantum mechanics from a theory of a system where you have to make measurements on it into a, a theory in which you can make predictions about things in the absence of things that look like traditional measurements, although those are certainly possible. I think part of the main message there is it's always possible to write down amplitudes, amplitudes for things, but as uh, has come up several times in this conference, the question is when can those amplitudes be consistently assigned probabilities? So the main framework of the theory is you have a set of histories, which could be lots of things depending on what your underlying uh, theory is, and an object called the decoherence functional that has to satisfy certain mathematical conditions. It's a generalization of the notion of quantum state in the algebraic sense of the term that does two things. Just like uh, the normal, the, the quantum state, which is part of this thing, it'll give you probabilities for amplitudes, but it also tells you when those amplitudes are meaningful in the sense um, that it measures the interference between those histories. And when that interference vanishes in the sense that this thing is diagonal, then the diagonal elements are the corresponding probabilities. So uh, there's obviously some mathematical structure here. Part, uh, I think one of the messages, I think modulo some technical considerations is you can regard the decoherence functional as an inner product on the space of histories and consequently there's a lot of the nice structure that you would normally have associated with such a thing. Um, uh, I have a couple of connected points today. One is that the normalization condition is one of the things that tells you that the diagonal elements of that decoherence functional can be interpreted as probabilities when and only when the interference between different alternatives vanishes, when those off-diagonal terms of the decoherence functional go away. Um, now, typically in the case of things like environmental decoherence, this thing is uh, fantastically small in a very short amount of time. Um, but nonetheless, this notion of consistency or decoherence is inherently approximate. Um, uh, and uh, I, I think that is and another point to make is there is almost no set of history, there, there is essentially for any but a non-trivial system, no set of histories which is completely fine-grained that is ever um, decoherent. Uh, somehow being able to assign probabilities to amplitudes implies that you must coarse grain. Um, I, I think that is a, a, an important point. And so just for the philosophers out there, there is a question about how that approximate decoherence and our picture of uh, quantum reality are connected with each other. 
So of course, uh, you might imagine whether this is connected with the uncertainty principle. Um, and of course, we have lots of different formulations of the uncertainty principle. Um, I'd like to add a new one, namely that you can regard the uncertainty principle as a measure of the interference between the states corresponding to alternative histories, um, or al formulated alternately as a measure of the coarse graining that's necessary for decoherence. So I'll make two short points about that, um, uh, namely that the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality um, set up in a suitable way uh, uh, can be interpreted as a generalized uncertainty principle between histories. It doesn't look much like the normal uncertainty principle that you see, but I will say in the ordinary context where you have a history that is just uh, projections onto ranges of outcomes of two different incompatible observables, um, there are two things one can observe about this. First of all, that generalized uncertainty principle I wrote down, the interference between histories, um, does in fact correspond to a particular formulation of the standard uh, formulation of the uncertainty principle. And equally importantly, and this is the part that's new, uh, well, I think that's new too, but um, the uncertainty principle, namely the commutator of those two operators, um, also sets a lower bound on the interference between two histories. So uh, the upshot of, uh, of all of that is that if you try and specify uh, incompatible observables too precisely, the corresponding histories will not decohere. So just so I finish on time, I'll go to the, to the main points here. Um, the, uh, uh, consistency decoherence is fundamentally um, approximate and uh, it paints a fundamentally coarse grain picture of reality. We can only assign probabilities to coarse grain things. As an example, the uncertainty principle supplies the physical, if in simple cases, coarse graining scale that you must coarse grain to uh, at which to get cons uh, consistency. And since we've been encouraged by certain people to be provocative, I'll add that I think one of the things that the uh, decoherent histories formulation tells us about quantum mechanics is that fundamentally quantum mechanics is a theory of relations between subsystems of a closed systems. And that's really what quantum mechanics is. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, David. Quantum theory is indeed a theory of information because we can derive it from six uh, principles that are purely of information theoretical nature, five of them are in common with classical information. The one which discriminates between classical and quantum is the conservation of information, or technically the purification principle. Here, by information, we mean uh, describing things in terms of uh, input-output relation between uh, events or transformations and uh, giving, assigning probabilities to closed circuits between preparation and observation. Now, the point is that we would want to go on and derive also the mechanics of the quantum, so quantum field theory. <coughs> and then we need to add additional principles. And uh, first of all, the one that information, uh, uh, information density is bounded. And then a set of principles that describe the topology of interaction in the easiest way. So this interaction must be unitary or lo local. There is a locality of interaction, homogeneity, isotropy. Uh, and then we take a minimal dimension for the systems in interaction. And this, all of them together, corresponds to minimize the algorithmic, to have a principle of minimal algorithmic complexity of the information processing, which resorts to have just a bunch of quantum gates that describe the physical law. And so the end of the story is that we have a description in terms of a quantum cellular automata. And what is astonishing is that from these principles, uh, there are only two quantum cellular automata that follow and they are connected by CPT. So the Lorentz covariance is broken, is recovered only in the relativistic limit of small masses and small wave vectors. Uh, and in the ultra relativistic uh, limit of uh, wave vectors of the order one, Lorentz covariance become only an approximate symmetry. So here, uh, and uh, you get the double spatial relativity uh, of uh, Giovanni Amelino Camellia, Lee Smolin, or Maguejo. Uh, here, the covariance is recovered uh, as invariance of the dispersion relation of the quantum automaton. So it's in the energy momentum uh, plane, so if, you, if you Fourier transform to get back to uh, space-time space points, you get a superposition of space-time. So you have a kind of quantum space-time coming out. And there is also the phenomenon of lo uh, relative locality. For those who are interested, that you can ask me. And <laughs> now, uh, if you see... This way, the quantum cellular automaton can be regarded as a kind of a unification between the Planck and Fermi scale. So uh, it gives uh, the, the usual quantum field theory uh, uh, only at the relativistic limit. What is amazing is that the same quantum cellular automata which give rise to Dirac, so um, I would say, sorry, in the, in the, the limit uh, of uh, the relativistic limit, both automata uh, converge to the Dirac equation. Uh, the same quantum automata also give rise to 
the Maxwell field, and by the way, in a very interesting way, through uh, something very similar to the Fermi neutrino theory of the photon. Indeed, also the boson uh, notion here is an emergent notion. It, it emerges from um, a huge number of fermions that you can accommodate at the Planck scale. And there is one last thing I want to remark, is that uh, clearly all this discrete description has the advantage that uh, you don't have all the problems that plug a quantum field theory that are related to the continuum. And uh, also, it solves the major problem of localization in quantum field theory. But most of all, you have a theory which, since it starts from principle, it, it doesn't need quantization. So it's a quantum ab initio. And this is actually probably the main uh, bonus of uh, having information is more fundamental. Thank you. I'm going to tell you about a um, derivation of quantum theory. A way of formulating quantum theory in terms of um, principles that have perhaps more um, physical, information, theoretic, and conceptually compelling flavor than just uh, giving a mathematical formalism. Uh, it's within a very broad general framework where we take um, a convex set of states and we have um, functionals in the dual space. So this is a set in a real vector space. Functionals in the dual space evaluate the functionals on the states and each functional corresponds to a measurement outcome, and we get the probability of that measurement outcome. Very broad framework. Um, the principles are every state lies in the convex hull of a set of perfectly distinguishable pure states. What's a pure state in this context? It's an extremal point of the convex set, a set that can't be further convex decomposed. Um, so for example, a classical bit, the extremal points are the endpoints of the line that tells you um, it's just a straight line segment, closed line segment. Uh, block ball, the extreme points are on the surface, uh, 3D sphere. That's the state of a space of a qubit. OK, so that's the first principle. Everything lies in what you might call a classical subsystem. Kind of natural, it means they've got a spectral decomposition. It's probably related to having a nice thermodynamics, maybe to being able to, well, I'll give you the second principle. For second principle, each of these classical subspaces or subsystems is related to every other one of the same size, the same cardinality, by a reversible transformation of the system. Um, so that sounds like it might also be related to having a nice thermodynamics. Very high degree of symmetry. Those are pretty strong axioms. Uh, they give you a property that the faces of the state space uh, form an orthomodular lattice. The faces are like the density, the sets of density matrices that are supported on uh, a subspace of the Hilbert space in standard quantum theory. That's an example of what faces are. Um, okay. So we have these, this high degree of symmetry. Uh, we get a lot of structure from that already. We get um, operations within the theory that are like von Neumann projection. They allow you to filter onto uh, subspaces of the, um, sorry, onto faces of the state space. Uh, they tell you whether or not you're in that, uh, and if you're in it, you don't get disturbed. So they're, they're projections, idempotent operators in the theory. OK, third, um, third principle. A lot of alternatives here. Uh, what is new in our formulation is um, we've shown that an equivalent alternative is um, no higher order interference. So Raymond, I think, earlier was telling us about um, experiments to test whether there, you might find higher order interference in quantum theory. Um, no higher order interference means any s experiment with any number of slits, and the slits are actually defined by these filters onto the faces, um, any experiment with any number of slits, you can make up the interference pattern, the probabilistic interference pattern, out of the smaller slits. Okay, that gives us so-called Jordan algebraic theories. Those are um, complex quantum theory, or real complex quantum theory, or quaternionic quantum theory. Or any theory whose state space is just a big ball in a large dimensional space, whatever dimension you want, um, finite. And octonionic three-dimensional quantum theory, which is a weird case. Um, so we're sort of close to standard quantum theory. To actually get quantum theory, again, there's a number of alternatives. Uh, we suggest energy observability. So the generator of any one parameter family of reversible transformations is an observable of the theory. And that gets you down uniquely to complex quantum theory. Um, so if there's any time left, questions? Otherwise, uh, there we are. Much, Alex, but, uh, thank you so much, Alex. Okay. I'm interested in 
this question. What is the path integral to trying to tell us? And specifically, I, I think far too much effort is spent trying to make sense of this picture and not nearly enough effort trying to make sense of this picture. If you think they're equivalent, well, they look different. Uh, but at the end, I'm going to be mucking around with this to make them not equivalent. So uh, this can give us new insights, and it's not equivalent if we muck around with it. Why should we be interested in this picture? Apart from, from time symmetry and not having to introduce a foliation, if, if you want general covariance and you want to treat the Lagrangian all, all together, space-time all together, you might also look for motivation if you're a realist and you just want what Adrian Kent calls a solution to the quantum reality problem, some story of what's happening between measurements um, without any weird discontinuities in it. Uh, another motivation would be if you want that story to live in space-time, as these, these paths do, uh, where there's a lot of effort trying to make gravity work in this crazy dimensional uh, configuration space, hardly any effort trying to fit quantum mechanics back into space-time, which sure would be nice. Uh, so let's take a look. Let's, let's take a look. So we got this uh, crazy uh, expression for the joint probability or scattering, or scattering probability or however you want to interpret this thing, uh, can we make, make sense of this? And at first glance, you might say, well, this is vaguely reminiscent of stat mech, in that if I want to know the probability of a macro state in stat mech, what I do is I sum up all the microstates of the probabilities of all those microstates that have that feature. And sure enough, here we are summing over paths where the action shares the feature that it has the boundaries consistent with the probability we're trying to find. Now, so very naively, you might say, wait a second. Why are we doing this in 3D anyway? Shouldn't we be actually looking at the sum over all microhistories instead of microstates? Well, uh, and to do this, you've got to get rid of dynamics, which is pretty weird. We're, we all like our dynamics. But it's at least plausible that you could do a 4D stat mech where you look at the space of histories and choose one out with this kind of logic. Now, unfortunately, it doesn't work so easily. If, I mean, it would be great. It would be game over. We, if, this, if this worked, we could say one of these paths really happened. We just don't know which one it was. We make a measurement, and we still don't know, but we can say something really happened. Now, it's not that simple, and the reason is that this doesn't look like that. There are three big problems. One is you're not summing probabilities, and the other two are you got complex and negative terms here. These are not probabilities. So uh, it's little known that two of these problems have a trivial solution. Uh, so <clears throat> the earliest I found this is in 91, but uh, basically you just write this out and s instead of summing over paths, you sum over pairs of paths, or you somehow double your parameter space. And at that point, you get rid of the square. So this, you can get rid of the square just by changing your definition of what sort of histories you're looking for. Then you can say, well, wait, for every pair of paths, there's the opposite pair of paths. And uh, you swap those around, and all of a sudden, now your imaginary amplitudes are gone, and you're left with a cosine. So this is certainly looking a lot closer to that than is traditionally thought. There's, it, we're, we're not as far away from the solution as we might have thought. So in, in my last minute, I'll tell you uh, my contribution of, of trying to actually change this, uh, restrict the path integral to only sum over cases where, uh, where you actually get positive equal probabilities, just like in StatMet. And the, uh, there are lots of ways to do it. The simplest way I've been playing around with is you just say, well, S that's the integral of Lagrangian density, which is a nice local covariant quantity. Why not just force that to zero? If you did force it to zero, um, and uh, oh, here, I'll just skip ahead here. If you did force this to zero and you only consider this subset of paths, all of a sudden, this story is this story in 4D. Um, is this going to work? Uh, it looks promising. You have to go to fields for one thing. Uh, you go to fields, you solve most of the problems. Um, you have to go to the ones with second order solutions like Klein-Gordon. But if you just start with these axioms, no dynamics, just zero Lagrangian density, equal a priori probabilities of every history, um, and say one of these really happens, just like in StatMech, um, some very interesting results coming out. The high field limit, you can argue your way to classical physics. And the low field limit, I got something that looks a lot like uh, quantum theory. And here's some more details. Thanks. Thank you so much, Ken. OK, so I will talk about a few ideas and results jointly with some other people. Um, OK, so let me start right away with the main message. So what I think is that the geometric structure of space-time and the probabilistic structure of quantum theory are actually closely related to each other. Um, now, this is not really a new idea, so it has been mentioned by many other people before. Some of them are actually at this conference. But what I think is that quantum information theory gives us tools to expose this clearly and to prove this actually rigorously, to really prove theorems on that. 
Um, and the last part will be some cool speculation towards quantum gravity. I think this tells us that maybe the world is even weirder than quantum theory. Now you may ask, what the heck should it mean that something's weirder than quantum theory and still makes sense? Well, some of you know that already, but for the rest, let me quickly explain this. So think of a, a standard Bell scenario with Alice and Bob who share an entangled quantum state and have some local measurement devices. Now, uh, you can just model like that where you have a black box. You have inputs A and B, which are Alice's and Bob's choices of measurements. You have outputs X and Y, which are the measurement outcomes. And the interesting object is this probability distribution. So P of X, Y given AB. Um, now we all know that um, classically, the Bell inequalities are satisfied. So for example, the CHSH inequality tells you that this correlation here is upper bounded by two. But quantumly, of course, we can get a larger value. We can get up to two square root of two. And now as Popescu and Rolich have shown, is that this is surprisingly not the best you could hope for. So there are correlations, the PR box correlations. They are just written here as a little table with probabilities of zero or one half. So they don't allow Bob and Alice to send signals, but they give you a CHSH value of actually four. So this is weirder than quantum theory because it's more non-local than quantum theory. And these PR boxes turn out to be actually states in a natural state space called the no signaling polytope. So the perspectives that this gives you, and Howard talked about this earlier, is that there's this landscape of possible probabilistic theories where quantum theory and classical probability theory are just special cases. And you have, for example, these strange PR boxes and lots of other stuff. Um, and actually almost all of them satisfy Rovelli's um, relational quantum mechanics postulates that we heard of, um, about a few days before. Um, now if you look, see it, look at the state spaces, then we've already seen the no signaling state space. You all know quantum theory. For example, Qubit is described by the Bloch ball. Higher level quantum uh, mechanics has a more complicated state space of density matrices. What does classical probability theory look like? Well, a classical bit is something like this. So it's like two possibilities and all the probabilistic mixtures. And a classical three level system is like this um, triangle. But now what happens if you want this to be in space? So you want rotations to act on this. And then it turns out that only very few of those actually allow to representations of spatial rotations. Yeah. So classically it's impossible. For the qubit it works because you can rotate it unitarily. Um, but now, so you need a kind of a roundness of your state space and it turns out that this actually enforces you to be non-classical. You cannot have this classical corners but you need something round and this enforces uncertainty relations for example. And it, always forces, it also forces you that you don't have too much non-locality like in the example before. Um, now this was about space, so what about time? If you believe in continuous time evolution, we've shown here that if you have continuous reversible time evolution and believe in quantum mechanics locally, it must also hold globally just as a consequence of that. So lots of constraints come from space time on the probabilistic structure of quantum mechanics. Now what that might this tell us? Well, here's some speculation. So if both of these things are so closely connected, then maybe if you think that space time is just an approximation, then maybe quantum theory is too. And I stop here with some references. Thank you. I, I work at the SETI Institute, and what I'm going to present is basically an application of information theory to non-human communication with the idea of extending it to any SETI signals that are detected. I try to tie it in uh, to last night's panel but um, no. by calling a talk Free Willy, but we, there are no orcas in this talk as this picture illustrates. So SETI looks for a narrow band carrier wave. So it asks, is there a transmitter? What I'm arguing is that we should listen to the message, if any, that comes in. So, and we can also practice on non, on extraterrestrial, meaning aquatic, uh, intelligent species that inhabit the oceans of the Earth and had a, a global communication system before we did. These are some of the animals we've, uh, and plants that we've uh, analyzed using information theory. They're uh, communication systems, and plants and trees and all do communicate with each other, and they're chemical and all these different kinds of communications. I'll present one kind of a way of analyzing, and it's a very simple relationship that's a linguistic relationship, and that's called Ziff's Law. If you plot the frequency of occurrence, the log log of the frequency of occurrence against rank of uh, signals in any book or a conversation or phonemes or whatever you care to, you get, generally get a minus one slope or a power law fit 
to the distribution of the frequency of occurrence. And uh, if you had equal distribution, a uniform distribution, of course, you'd get a horizontal line. But it turns out all human languages produce this minus one slope. And uh, so what we did is we compiled a, a dictionary of Bonnelow's dolphins uh, whistles, whistle language, or whistle communication system, and we plotted their frequency of occurrence, and we got minus one for humans, minus one slope for dolphins, which was interesting. That means that they have the potential, it's a sufficient, it's a necessary but not sufficient condition to have a minus one slope. And it didn't work for squirrel monkeys very well, and ground squirrels didn't have obey this law at all. So he, we went ahead and implied complexity, meaning rule relationships, conditional probabilities between signals, and this is a dolphin syntax diagram, the first one, we think. Then uh, two babies were born at Marine World, two baby dolphins, bottlenose dolphins, and we noticed that for humans, uh, when babies are born, they babble, and they produce a kind of a shallow slope, about point, oops, sorry, about 0.7 or 8, and uh, minus 0.7, about. And it turned out that the baby dolphins also were babbling their whistles. They produced a slope that was not Ziff's slope. And as they grew up, we saw that they went from uh, minus 0.7 to 0.8, and then humans get very redundant. They go up to about 1.4, minus 1.4. Dolphins went to about minus 1.1, and then they converge on minus 1 with adulthood. So in other words, we we determine that baby dolphins are born babbling. Uh, if you want to do a pulsar, just in case you don't trust Ziff's slope to be able to distinguish between uh, astrophysics and uh, intelligent communication, that is a very flat slope due to a pulsar. Now, we can go ahead and use the higher order entropies. And as we know, Ziff's law is only uh, the components of the first order uh, Shannon entropy. Here's what we get from the animals we've analyzed so far. Elephant rumbles and humpback whales social feeding calls in Alaska are within that purple intelligence filter region. A humpback whale and birdsong are not. Squirrel monkeys are not. So eventually we want to we want to design an encephalization quotient based on communication intelligence, which is what we SETI will detect. And uh, so we have something like this that we can know where we stand as far as extraterrestrials. And I will say thank you for inviting me to this conference in Humpback. OK, I'm going to talk for a few minutes about um, an experiment we're doing at Fermilab. So we've, we've heard a lot of um, talk about, and not so many, uh, about theories and not so many experiments to do with Planck scale physics and quantum gravity and so on. It is possible that real Planck scale quantum geometry uh, can have an effect not just confined to Planck scales, but on macroscopic scales as well. And that is, that's a violation of quantum field theory on large scales, not on small scales. It's an unusual extension. It is well motivated from a lot of the kinds of information theoretic arguments, black hole evaporation, things like that. You can, um, you can do an estimate of the effect just using information theory. Um, and uh, one way to think about it is that, um, that the position of a massive body far away um, is uncertain by a certain amount, which is given by the diffraction limit of Planck radiation. That is, if you have a wave function between two places, the angular position is uncertain by that diffraction limit, and that corresponds in distance to the geometric mean of the Planck wavelength and the distance. Another way to think about that is that any massive body in space never stands still, but that the geometry itself is wiggling around like a random walk of about one Planck length every Planck time. Now, for a laboratory apparatus, in our case, it's about 40 meters. Um, is about a microsecond of time involved in measuring this uh, non-local effect. It's a quantum state over this 40-meter scale. And, and over that time, the, the amount of effective motion, the uncertainty in the wave function of sort of everything, of the geometry at that separation, um, is about an atometer, so you know, 10 to the minus 18 meters or so. Unbelievably, that's actually a detectable amount with modern interferometer technology. So we're using machines which are quite similar to those that are used to detect gravitational waves, like LIGO and GEO 600. So we've built two of these things at Fermilab that are operational now. Um, we're cross-correlating two Michelson interferometers. So effectively, what we're doing is measuring the entanglement of these systems 
um, just due to the fact that they occupy the same space-time volume and nothing else. So it's a space-time entanglement being measured formally at Planckian precision, meaning that this, the noise limit of the experiment will be given by the Planck spectral density of position noise. Um, you can do that because you're using 10 to the 20, 10 to the 21 photons per second, huge number of photons to measure a quantum state, measuring position to a precision which is much smaller than a wavelength, in fact, to about an atometer over an integrated period of time. So as I said, the experiment's uh, it's being built now, it, it's, uh, it's being commissioned now, and we expect to optimistically reach Planck sensitivity within a year or two. I'll stop there. And I'll take one question. I'll take you, one question, you, right? You were the first person yeah. to finish so quickly that you earned the question. Yeah, there you go. So, yeah, yeah. You may keep the yeah. question yeah. quick so next time. <laughs> right. Yeah. What is the experiment called? Oh, thank you. Yes. It's um, the Fermilab holometer. That was so quick that we can. The word holometer one. is in the Oxford English Dictionary. It means a mathematical machine for measuring almost anything. It's an ancient word. Anyone else have a short question? All right. Thanks again, <laughs> thank Greg. Thank you. Thank you. Somebody, somebody. I'd like to tell you about some parallels between maximum entropy reasoning and uh, quantum field theory and some reflections uh, on these parallels. So we've heard a lot about entropy. Uh, I'm talking here about uh, Shannon entropy and I'm thinking about it as a way of quantifying the amount of uncertainty in a distribution. So we have the standard formula up there and then two very poor sketch diagrams, one of which on the left has a low entropy and the one on the right that has a higher entropy. One of the ways in which we can use the Shannon entropy is to basically construct probability distributions in the light of incomplete information. We can basically use the, uh, the, the idea of maximising the entropy consistent with the constraints we wish to impose. And then this basically fills in the gaps uh, in, in, our, in our distribution in the least biased way. So for example, say we want to, uh, we'll need to keep our probability distributions normalized. So that sets this, uh, we want the expectation value of 1 to be 1. We might want to set the expectation value of some function f of x to be some number, g of x to be some other number. So then we simply use Lagrange multipliers, maximize s consistent with these constraints and we, get a, and we get a solution like I've illustrated on the bottom line. Then we fiddle with the Lagrange multipliers until we hit the precise values we want to do. So that's how we use maximum entropy to, um, uh, uh, to construct probability distributions. Now that we can then use those distributions to make further predictions in, li and in light of the current ones, and if these further predictions don't agree with what we predict, we can then update them by adding in, uh, new, uh, by adding in new, new, new constraints. So basically we can keep improving our probability distribution for, for making predictions uh, in light of new information. Now it turns out if you think about rather than a single, prob uh, a single field like I illustrated there, you know, if you do a multi-dimensional thing, you can imagine a field uh, at various grid points on space-time, then you can basically construct uh, something that is basically Euclidean quantum field theory. So we use a few low-order uh, correlations and we would try and use those to make future predictions. And basically the, uh, the, exponent, the probability exponent on the previous page becomes the path integral action. Um, so we get free, free field theory, you know, we just get that by saying what we want the scatter at a point to be and then the scatter between nearest neighbours that generates the kinetic terms and the mass terms. So we might want to use that then to predict what we think the cubic uh, result correlation should be, and it might turn out to be, um, uh, it, it, would, it would turn out to be zero for the free field case. But we might do measurements and find that the, the, the cubic uh, correlation term should actually be non-zero. So now we need to construct a new distribution uh, by putting in a, a, a value for the expectation value of phi cubed as a constraint. And so this basically then regenerate, this generates an interaction term and, um, and to make things fit we then have to fiddle with the coefficients in terms of the phi squared and the kinetic terms and regularization and renormalization appear. So I've been basically thinking about maximum entropy as a bridge between quantum field theory and information theory. And it seems that 
with this perspective, the, there are a number of questions and, 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 uh, and viewpoints that are quite useful. So you might think quantum field theory is basically just maximum entropy reasoning. That's just a, a very sensible way of reasoning. So can quantum field theory ever be wrong? You know, but we might be able to improve it. We might be able to marginalize over interaction terms, for example. On the information theory side, we know when we do quantum field theory, we have complex numbers involved. And so we might be able to see quant uh, complex numbers coming into quantum field theory. We also have fermions in quantum field theory. Maybe they have an analogy uh, in information theory that we can use to go beyond the normal uh, approach we take to uh, information theory and reasoning using real numbers. Okay. Great. Well, thanks, Stephen. Thank you.